Hello and welcome to Face to Face. Today we're talking to Victoria resident Don Scott. Uh, Don is uh, someone with a long-standing interest in economics and the economy. Uh, as I'm sure everybody who's watching this show today knows, uh, very interesting things are happening in the economy. Not necessarily good things, but big and interesting. And we're going to take a look at these issues from a different point of view than you usually get in the media. So Don, I'll start by asking you uh, not about the housing crisis in the United States, which everyone thinks was the trigger, the subprime mortgage disaster, but what lies behind that? How did we get to the situation we're now in? A lot of people would like to know that, <laughs> including me. I could just give you some hunches of, of what I have towards okay. that. And I think an awful lot of it has to do with the type of economy that we've built for the last 25, 30 years. We built an economy where everything that had to do with public services, um, the role of government in society has been negative. Government is bad, private sector is good, and you deregulate the private sector. And you get sections of the private sector, like the finance in industry in particular, which has grown so substantially in, uh, in 2005, or 2007, I'm sorry, uh, the finance sector made up 40% of all corporate profits in the United States. That's like three, four times what it ever was historically. And so we ended up having an economy with a whole lot of puff in it, a whole, just a massive, massive bubble, which uh, they were selling things. I, I heard a, uh, a former president of the Reserve Bank of Richmond last uh, week there was reading an, an item by, uh, had a quote from him saying that these bank executives didn't have a clue what they were buying when they were investing in so many of these securitized debt obligations that they were buying and which essentially have collapsed in value. Now this isn't Richmond, BC. This no, is... no, that's right. Uh, Richmond is one of the, the Federal Reserve that people refer to is made up, I believe, of a dozen reserve banks and they're stretched from New York to this one is Richmond, I'm not sure where Richmond is, uh, Virginia, I believe, and then there's banks in California, Texas, yeah. and that sort of thing, they make up the Federal Reserve. So the, uh, the president of one of those banks was just commenting on just how irresponsible the finance sector had been in saying that there's two basic desks in a trading firm, in an investment bank. There's a trading desk and there's a risk desk. And the risk desk is supposed to say, no, you shouldn't be going places. And the two, er two areas fight amongst one another. The trading guys, they're the ones that get the big rewards and the big bonuses for the trading activity, and they don't want anything to interfere with that. Whereas, so the risk guys, for the last better part of a decade have lost all the arguments and when they said you're going to something we don't really understand it. And they were hiring physicists, PhDs in physics, to develop models to put together financial different elements of maybe some loans, it may be credit card debt, maybe uh, uh, different types of mortgages. And they would put them together in different packages and then sell those packages off to people. And the people really didn't know what was underlying those When things. you say sell them off to people, you're talking about the very people, some of whom are watching this show today. Yeah, well, their mutual funds are buying them as money market items. And uh, so they, these things, as with every house of cards, when the cards start to be pulled from the base, it all falls. And that's what's happening. The, currently, the U.S. major financial sector, people like Noriel Rubini, who's an economist who has basically predicted all of what's happening now two, three years ago. He started issuing strong warnings and writing article after article about it. And now he's known as Dr. Doom because he predicted this. And um, some of the comments that he's made more recently is that the whole U.S. capital financial system, the, the banks, uh, are worth about one and a half trillion dollars but they expect them have to have to write off, he thinks, close to $3 trillion. So it means they're insolvent. And which even the more conservative people think they have to write off about $2 trillion, which still leaves them insolvent. When you say then, because uh, I've read this in very, very small stories mm -hmm. in the Times columnist just a couple of days ago, there was a little one-inch story quoting somebody from the United States financial community saying that, yes, the U.S. banks are insolvent. Yeah. Does this mean they're bankrupt? Essentially. So the banking system of the United States is essentially bankrupt. That's what they're saying. Now, when I say that, I don't even know what it means I because don't it's either. it's it's to like be, bigger be, than one can it, imagine. It is it is bigger than we can imagine. But that's why this calls even Greenspan last week. Alan Greenspan called for the nationalization of the banks. 
and they when they nationalize a bank as they did in Sweden back in the uh, well, I think it was in the, in the early 90s they had to nationalize some banks that went south and uh, they what they do is then they take the parts of the banks that have some good assets and they restructure the bank with the good assets and then they take the bad ones and they put them together and try to get the best uh, return they can possibly on those and that essentially gets absorbed by the public should should the citizenry of this country and even more so in the United States, although I have a feeling that we're going to be following them into this spiral of, of uh, financial doom, yeah, as it yeah. seems to be, but right now they're the ones leading the way. They, they Should are. the citizenry be expected to buy out the, I mean, it's probably the wealthiest 10 or 15% that are really going to take a hit. Should the rest of us have to pay? And that's where they're calling, for many more voices are now calling for the nationalization of the banks because when they nationalize the banks, all the stockholders lose everything they've got. And you fire all the executives and they don't get any bonuses and you go after them for the amount of money that they've ripped off the system in years past. If Obama was to do that, his popularity would soar and he would collect literally hundreds of billions of dollars in, in, uh, in revenues to put into the economy to try and, and, and give some support. Because, you know, when you just bail, to just bail banks is nowhere near as important in a recession as to provide money for food stamps in the U.S. system, at least, unemployment insurance, to protect those people who are losing their livelihoods. You don't want people, you know, on the streets as we're having increasingly in our cities uh, and you don't want a repeat of the Depression. And that was largely because there were no safety nets. There have been some very prominent people in the United States uh, over the last months and, and even year or so saying that there is going to be civil unrest in the United States if things get as bad as many people think they are going to be. Well, I think that's, I would hope that wouldn't happen, but it wouldn't surprise me uh, if they keep given bailout money to the bank executives and they keep their massive salaries and everyone else is losing their shirts. There's, why wouldn't people demonstrate in some form? So what's, form what's happening now then is that the bailout money is essentially going to the banks and I think you just suggested a minute ago that a better place to put all those hundreds of billions of dollars would be into food stamps, unemployment insurance, programs to keep people in their homes and programs to give money to the people at the bottom. Yeah, to and put try. money back into the economy. Because the, the people at the bottom, when you give them $10, they're going to spend $10. When you give it in a tax cut, most of the money in tax cuts goes to the wealthy anyway, in, especially you do across-the-board tax cuts. And they're not going to necessarily reinvest that in the economy. They're the people taking money out of the economy as it is because they don't think they're going to get the returns that they did in the years past. So they're slowing down on their investments. And that's starting to ripple through all aspects of it. And, and as far as you mentioned earlier about Canada being not as effective as the U.S., the U.S. leading the way, well, other countries have caught up very quickly with them. Uh, Japan in particular, its GDP last uh, quarter fell by three, over 3%. It's an annualized rate of about 12% drop in GDP. Is that a large change? Massive. All of our forecast here, the federal government's forecast and the provincial government's forecast for us is like 0.9%, 0.9% drop in GDP as opposed to a 12% GDP on an annualized basis that, that Japan could be facing if things don't turn around. Their exports, they're very much, in some ways, Japan may be a better comparison to Canada than comparing us to the U.S. is because like Japan, we are very dependent on exports. Japan exports manufactured goods, we export energy, we export raw materials, we export uh, uh, basic iron and uh, steel products, that sort of thing of, of, of fairly large volumes. And uh, so we're very dependent upon our market, and our market is primarily the United States. And historically, whenever the United States has got a cold, we've got pneumonia. Now, when in, in the first minute, when we just began uh, the introduction to this show, uh, you said that um, one of the fundamental concerns or problems is that we've moved away from government being an important part of uh, the economy towards only the private sector being considered important. Taxes are bad. 
public is bad, mm -hmm. private is good, and um, I mean, that's the way things have been going. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that a little bit and, and the role government can play in a successful economy and society? Well, I think we saw that all through the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, uh, where we had a huge growth in the middle class uh, in North America. You go back into the growth of the middle class, and back World War I, there wasn't much of a middle class. And what there was of it got wiped out during the Depression. And it came back, and came back extremely strong after the Second World War. And a major part of that was a massive amount of a role of the public sector. Not only were they building roads and in basic infrastructure, but they were building schools. In Canada, we expanded our universities dramatically in the 1960s to be able to accommodate all the baby boomers coming in. Whereas, you know, when my dad was lucky enough to be sent to university by an uncle who could afford to send him when he was in his mid-twenties back in this was 1930s, uh, he uh, was one of only five or six percent of the population that would have had a university education. Today, we're looking at numbers many times that. And it's because of the huge amount of public investment that went into post-secondary institutions. And the hospital sector, you know, the whole health sector, um, even the social services sector, all those areas were uh, created jobs that were very decent paying jobs. And those, that created opportunities for a wage level within, and, um, a decent wage level for people to move into the middle class. And then the manufacturing demands that came not just from the people in the public sector, but also private sector, even more so because it's much larger. Uh, the automakers, the uh, manufacturing sector that we had that developed at that point in time, created a massive amount of wealth. Now we're in a situation, and for the last number of years, not only have we been shrinking the role the government has played, in some areas they've almost been experimental, one could say, is places like California, where they have on Proposition 13, you may recall, was around 25 years ago, which was a major uh, attempt to restrict the ability of the state to even charge tax, or to increase any kind of taxes, and a major effort to reduce taxation in the state. And what that has brought for California, that used to be the most prosperous state in the United States, is now got the highest unemployment in the United States at 10.2 percent last month. I didn't know and that. yeah, and they uh, they have a state budgetary deficit that they just uh, tried to address this past week after weeks of uh, wrangling all night sessions to try and balance a forty billion dollar deficit in that one state. So what you're saying though is that part of the reason for this deficit, and and we're seeing them everywhere. We're seeing them here in BC. We're seeing them in Canada, yeah. uh, California. I was watching CNN the other day, and um, they. They used California as the illustration where thousands of people are, of public sector employees are facing layoff. But I think what you're saying is that a big part of that here in Canada as well as in the United States is that the public sector has simply continually lowered taxes, especially on wealthy individuals and big business, and therefore sure. no longer has the revenue to play yeah. the important role that government did play after World War II right through to the 1970s. Yes. Yeah, that, I think that's exactly right. And it's been a major campaign by the people on the right to diminish the capacity of government. When George Bush came into office in, seems like decades ago, but it was only eight years ago, uh, the United States was, people were forecasting the United States would be debt free within 15 years. George Bush came in and within months of him coming into office said, Surpluses are bad because they only encourage government spending and government spending isn't good. So since that time, he more than doubled the national debt of the United States. It now stands at almost $11 trillion. When he came into office, it was about five. And that's even before the recession has hit. And it's going to spiral, going up by probably a billion dollars at least this year and more likely the same next year. So his... Most of his, uh, the, in the United States, most of that deficit, or the debt, I should say, most of the debt, the debt growth has been because of reductions in revenues. If you look at the expenditure levels of the government in the United States, they've moved up very, very, very slowly. 
But if you look at the revenues in the U.S., and especially the revenues towards the wealthiest group, and you've got to appreciate that the U.S. still has a progressive tax system, as does Canada, but there's been efforts to erode the progressivity of our tax system. And for, as an example, in the U.S., the top 5% of income earners pay 55% of all income taxes paid. And historically, income taxes made up about 55% of the U.S. revenues. They're now down to around 49, 50%. Can you just say that again? The top 5% of income earners pay, did you say 55%? I did. Of all income taxes? Yes. The top 1% is... pay 33% of all income taxes collected. Well, let's look at that. The top 1%, is that because they're horribly overtaxed and being forced into no, poverty? No, it's because they're it because... fabulously wealthy and they pay amazing amounts. When the tax system was introduced in the United States in uh, 1913, uh, it only assessed taxes on the very wealthy. And then during the Depression, uh, actually something fascinating in reading of all people's books, Conrad Black's book on the FDR, he has a magnificent chapter in there on FDRs fighting the uh, Depression when he got elected in, in 1932. And uh, one of the things that happened, it was actually Hoover who did this, is he moved the top, tar the top marginal tax rate on a progressive system. You have different tranches of taxation where you have maybe no taxes for people that make less than $12,000 a year, but someone that makes between twelve and 30000 or 40000 pays, you know, maybe a 5% tax and above that a 15% and then you go up. The tax rates in the U.S. were as high as 94% for the top for the richest Americans at one point in time. Now, just it would be 94% on the... Additional amount, the last... The, yeah, the, the amount above, amount the there. amount above that top margin. Right, so maybe the after they margin, earn one million. Exactly. The That's what most of it was, was a million. Some years it was three and four million when they were paying 94% right. on that. So is this progressive taxation a good thing? Because we certainly don't have much of it in Canada anymore. That progressivity well, where those who have a higher income pay a mm -hmm. higher rate on that higher income. That's disappearing here. We still have it, but it's not, as, it's not quite as remarked as it once was. Right. But still, in Canada, the rates I mentioned, the top 5% paying 55%. In Canada, it's probably the top 10% that pay 50 or 55% of all income taxes collected. This is totally the opposite of what most people think. They just don't appreciate to think the middle class and the, and the poor pay the bulk of the income taxes, and it just isn't right. It's not true, uh, I should say. It's right that they do. The wealthy do pay the higher level of taxes. And without progressive taxation, something I've started to look at in theory that I'm starting to evolve or explore is that without progressive taxation, you don't have a middle, a middle class. So you mean without progressive taxation, the wealthy will simply get Wealthier super wealthy, wealthy mm -hmm. and everyone else will fall into... Uh, there's no redistribution of income, and it's through the redistribution of income, and I don't mean by redistribution of income, I don't mean paying from the rich and paying, paying money to people on welfare. Some of it will go to people on welfare, but most of it goes for building roads, highways, schools, providing services in hospitals, um, and various other public services that, that we have that make us a civil society, run our courts, even run our prisons. All that money has to come from the public sector, and all that money has to come through taxation. So when you look at countries around the world that do not have progressive income taxation, hardly any of them have a middle class. I would say none of them have a middle class. Can you give me an example? Mexico, all of Latin America. Okay, let's take Mexico. All, almost, all of a, almost all of Asia. Right, so Mexico does not have progressive income taxation. No. It has a small, wealthy elite. Exactly. And probably a very small middle class. Very small. And a compared very large to what, group at the bottom. Compared to what we're used to. Yeah. Um, and the, the middle class there are, are, is growing in the developing world, and it's growing very rapidly. But that's because, in large measure, so much of what used to be done in Europe, Western Europe, and in North America in manufacturing has been dispersed to those countries. So we're building a greater, greater, a greater level of employment and opportunities for people to move up and to enter what... Uh, the economists would rate as a middle class, and they're talking middle class worldwide as incomes over about $3,500 or $4,000 a year. Very low levels of income compared to what we have and what we're used to in, these, in our country. But uh, still $4,000 a year in China is a pretty princely income, you know, compared to what it was a few years back. 
Let's talk a bit about the shifting tax load in Canada and the United States, how taxes have evolved over the past 30 or 40 years from where we were to where we now are. Um, I've actually got more information on the U.S. in my mind than I do because that's where I've done okay, more so research We recently. can talk about the United States, but it's yeah. probably not dissimilar to it's, Canada. Canada is quite parallel in many respects. Okay. Uh, in the U.S., the biggest new source of revenue, the biggest growth in revenue, or, or the share of revenue coming from different types of taxation, Social Security taxes used to be about 30% of all revenue. And the Social Security tax in the U.S. is their equivalent. There's their Social Security, which is their uh, pension payments and their unemployment insurance payments and that kind of, of tax, so that they assist the elderly, they assist the, um, the um, uh, medical care services for, for the elderly and for the, very, um, for the very poor, as well as they provide uh, unemployment insurance. And they have gone from 30% to about 37% of gross revenues. So now in the Social Security tax in the U.S., Bill Gates pays the same social security tax that a manager or a, a floor supervisor at Walmart does. So you mean it's just a flat 30, amount? It's a flat amount. It tops off at thirty-some thousand dollars a year uh, income, and you make if you make a million dollars a year, you don't pay any more social security tax than if you make thirty thousand dollars a year. Now that's the kind of tax that those on the economic right wing, like for mm -hmm. example the Canadian Taxpayers Federation and most right wing politicians, they want these flat taxes they, they because do. somebody making ten dollars an hour is paying yeah. somebody is paying the same amount as somebody making a yeah. million dollars a year. They think it's unjust for someone who is wealthy to pay a very large amount of income taxes. And they think that it, it uh, is somehow rather unfair. Yeah. And my response to that is that not only is it fair, it is proper because those people have benefited by far the most from living in this particular society or that society. As well, you wouldn't have the society with it. You're going back to um, a society of monarchs if you want that. You mean a feudal society? Before, a feudal yes. society with very few people having all the control and all the power and the regular bulk of the population having next to none. And also, I mean, the argument I think, think about when, when we talk about this issue is that the capitalist system is completely unfair in the way it distributes wealth in the first place. I mean, you just have to look at hockey players making $7 it's, million yeah, dollars a yeah, year and somebody yeah. cleaning hospitals making $12 yeah. an hour. And it's, I don't think it's intended to be fair. No, it's You not. know, in fair to that, that's its job. But the society's job, the government's job, is to take from that, the Robin Hood effect, if you wish, take from that those, those people that have those massive incomes and pull it into the public sector to provide services and employment for the general population. And it's it's amazing how well it works in countries that don't. I mean, Russia is a prime example of a, of a country that's gone from a, uh, a, a communist system of government where everyone was supposed to be equal, and clearly they weren't, but then you had gone to a capitalist system where they've got a bunch of oligarchs, and they have all the wealth now. And there really hasn't been that great a distribution within the country. And they don't have a decent tax system. The wealthy still don't pay taxes there to anywhere near the degree that they do in the United States or in Canada or in Western Europe or in this particular place like Scandinavia, which have a much, much more even distribution of income between the populations. There was a study that, uh, if I can find here, uh, that was done in, in, uh, by the Korean Department of Finance. Here it is looking at income distribution within a society. And they measured, they looked at it two different ways. Uh, and they looked at OECD countries. OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is basically all of the large economies of the world. I think the top 28 or 29. Oh, it's maybe even more than that, 37, I think, or something. Like now, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. But the, the, when you look upon the different, they, they looked at the top 10% of income earners and how much does the top 10% of income workers earn compared to the bottom 10%. And they found the average within the OECD was about three and a half times. So the top 10% would earn three and a half times as much as the bottom 10% of that, income earners. That's correct. Okay. And that was, uh, that was 10 years ago. It's now moved up to about four and a half times. And uh, they looked between countries in, in countries like uh, uh, Hungary, the United States, Hungary was 5.6 times. Uh, another 
former communist country. The United States was four and a half times. Korea was around four and a half times. And uh, the, uh, some of the European countries, the Scandinavian countries in particular, they were only two and a half times. So in, in the countries which I look upon as being some of the most progressive and best places to live, mm -hmm. maybe Sweden, Norway, Denmark, these kinds of countries, one significant thing is that people who earn a lot do not earn, the rich are not that much richer than the poor. There isn't that dramatic difference that right. there is in North America. And because right. of that, you have a society that works better. It's much more egalitarian. It's much more, uh, they're certainly just as inventive. The amount of, of patents per pa uh, you know, on the size of the population in, in countries like Sweden and Finland and Norway and whatnot is just as high as it is in the West, or in, in what we call the West or North America. Um, it's uh, another way that they looked at it is how many, what percentage of the population earns two thirds of the median income. And in Canada, the median income is around $45,000. So that, how, what percentage of our population makes $30,000 a year? And in, the, uh, in Canada, 22% of our population is making that low income, or below two-thirds of the average income. In the Scandinavian countries, it's one quarter of that. And so that's the decision that uh, is made if you want a... Uh... I mean, if, if you want what to me seems like a better and fairer society, you just have to make sure that those earning the most are not doing too much better than those at the bottom, which means fairer wages and a fairer tax system basically. to allow, basically to allow a situation where the rich are here and the poor are here. Mm -hmm. And that's what we used to have in Canada. But we've now gone to a situation where the away. rich are here and the poor are here. Yeah. And we as, as a citizenry, have got to make that kind of decision. Now, we do. as it turns out in Canada these days, we don't really have that much of a voice because I think a lot of Canadians would prefer to see a fairer and more egalitarian system, but we seem to have lost control of our governments. Control has been taken over largely by that wealthy elite and, uh, and big business. And they have decided without our input that they want a society where the rich are very rich because they are the very rich. And, and, that, and they're the kinds of people who want that. And they're the only voice you hear. And they're the only voice you hear. You know, the media is so dominated and so concentrated in North America today. Like, look at the Asper family. And they're at the Asper Media Empire. Cam West <coughs> Global, Vancouver Sun, Vancouver Providence, Victoria Times Colonist, all the uh, Kelowna, Prince George, all the daily newspapers, all controlled by them. They have about 70% of the media, daily media market in B.C., people, 70% of the population is exposed to that every day. And you get one opinion. You know, the, 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 the opinions are actually starting to moderate and expand a little tiny bit now. But, but, but for most of the last decade, uh, it has gotten narrower and narrower. And the, the message that we have seen and the message that we have heard is government is bad and the private sector is good. And now that they're facing that that whole model has essentially collapsed, it's just tumbled with the collapse of the U.S., to have the U.S. Ba banking system as an example of the most outrageous excesses that we've had in the country with people making $50 billion a year and many of them making billions a, a year in bonuses and whatever else. It's just ob obscene levels of compensation for a few individuals. Um, to see that system collapse it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and they don't have a lot of buy-in from the public when they keep telling us that that's the ideal. And yet the message really hasn't changed. I haven't heard any change in the message coming from the corporate media. It's still... Not really. Yeah, not, not really. really. And, and that's something, it's a massive failure in our democracy not to have had maintained a much broader base of the media than we do today. To allow the corporate concentra concentration that we have in the media, I think, is just grossly irresponsible. Very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. And it's uh, for, especially for a democracy. Because in a democracy, if um, people buy newspapers in large measure, and Comrade Black was very open about this, that his, his reason for getting into the media was to influence what people saw and to push his, uh, his opinions upon, uh, uh, upon it. And they do it not so much through editorials, because no one writes editorials, but they do it by changing the staff 
to get like-minded people writing the stories, and they write from a perspective. Um, I went to see a presentation, and I've forgotten his name now, a fellow who used to be the, an editor of um, the Vancouver Sun, and he was uh, at UVic last year as a writer-in-resident and uh, gave a public lecture on the role of the media today, and he was just uh, devastating on, on the state of the media and the amount of interference they had in what they could write in the Vancouver Sun, of what was acceptable to write, the tone it was acceptable to write, the message it was acceptable to give. It's incredible. And in a democracy, public debate is essential to be able to have an informed electorate and to be able to participate in the electoral process with some idea besides TV ads telling you who to vote for. And I think it's important that we as citizens realize that that's endemic right through all of our television, all of our radio, mm -hmm. all of our newspapers, and, and all the corporate magazines as well, that every story is controlled. Not just the big ones, but everything is controlled because everybody knows what's acceptable and what isn't and what yeah. you can talk about and what you can't. And if you're not willing to play by those rules, then there's somebody else who will very happily take your job and you will, yeah. be, you will be gone. So everything and we don't get honest messages from the media. We just get, it's basically corporate propaganda. Well, how many messages do we get in Canada of this war in Afghanistan being a complete waste? <clears throat> We've all been sold that this is Canada being almost like our old peacekeeping missions, that we are doing some social good in Afghanistan by our presence there. When we've had the security situation in the country is reported even by a Canadian general who just uh, held over rains a couple of days ago saying it's worse now than it's ever been. That's after we've been there for what, six years? You know, how many guys have lost their lives? How many billions of dollars has Canada spent over there? And why are we even there in the first place? Afghanistan never attacked anybody. They had some rogue elements working in Afghanistan and training in Afghanistan that went off and attacked. Well, the message we're given in the media is that we're there fighting for the rights of women and children and for democracy. Exactly. Exactly. Which, uh, you know, if that was the case, then one could see uh, a point for being there, but I don't think that's the case at all. It, I don't think there's much evidence that there's any no. democratic growth in, in the country. Especially when we don't see democratic growth in Canada. Yes. Uh, or the rights that's of true. women and children. More and more people are being forced into poverty here. Mm -hmm. um, let's just talk a little bit more about income transfer in Canada from the poor to the rich. Uh, that's basically, I don't know, it's not, it's not so much a transfer, but without the, with the public sector, with government playing less of a role through taxation, it just means that the wealthy maintain a greater share of their wealth and are able to accumulate it at a greater rate. So then you get the discrepancy. It's not the government taking money from the rich and giving, or taking money from the poor and giving to the rich. It's allowing the rich to keep more and more of their revenue so there's less and less to give to the people that need it at the bottom. Yeah. And it's coming, I think, to, uh, to bear and to show and to illustrate, California is probably the best illustration, the middle as well. And you see, I mean, they're talking to 20,000 layoffs in the, in the California civil service. Um, now those are middle class jobs? Middle class jobs, yes. They're all, most of them, to work in the public sector, most people have to have at least a high school education. They're better educated jobs. The public sector workforce is much higher educated than most of the private sector workforce is. And uh, so, you know, you have the aspirations, go to school and uh, go to college, university, whatever. Um, more and more of those people are going to find there's less and less out there for them to do. It's going to be, like when I graduated in 1971, it's an interesting personal story in a sense, but I, I took business at St. Vax. And when I entered in 1967, there was four jobs for every graduate. When I left, there were seven jobs for 70 graduates. And most people don't, we didn't even realize at the time, but we were graduating at the start of a recession, just like today. And nobody came to recruit. Well, they, all the companies from Ontario and Quebec who normally came to the maritime universities to, to recruit, didn't show up. They just weren't hiring. One thing that's happened quite a bit over the last 10 or 20 years is we've had major tax cuts that have been put in place uh, by the Chrétien government and now by Stephen Harper. Uh, essentially what 
that has meant is that the federal and provincial governments have less money to spend on social programs and etc. Um, it means a small increase to a lot of people, but not so much money that you'd really notice. But those uh, who have real wealth and real income and the corporations have had huge tax cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can just show us some graphs that you've got that illustrate that. Sure. Well, let's start off with just the relationship on the federal government side. Um, can you see this okay? The red line is, uh, is federal government revenues, and you can see how sharply they have declined. The blue line is uh, provincial government revenues, and you'll see they declined for a period. The rise in through here is mostly, I believe, Alberta and the uh, Saskatchewan and the boom in revenues to them through the oil, uh, oil royalties and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's been a, a, a distinct drop of revenues from 18% of GDP down to just over 14% of GDP for the federal government. Now, and this is a huge amount of money that's, it, it been, is. that's been lost to the federal government. During a time when, when I watch the media or listen to the media, we're always being told that taxes are going up, taxes are going up. Mm -hmm. But clearly, if you look at this graph, then as a percent of our wealth, taxes are going down. That they are. And this gives you an illustration of the value, how much those tax cuts have cost us. The ones in the red are the tax cuts that were brought in by the Liberal government and federally. And the, the blue lines is the uh, Harper government, since they've been in office, and the value of their tax cuts. And they now total annually $70 billion. So you mean there, in this year, let's say, 2009 to 2010, that, yes. that one year, the government is losing a total of $70 billion in revenues compared to what it would have taken in, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago, had taxes remained the same. Exactly right. Okay. So exactly when we hear then about, for example, we can't afford to build schools anymore, and we can't afford health care, yes. and we can't afford to hire a few more police, mm -hmm. and we can't afford roads because now they've all got to be P3s, mm -hmm. it's because we simply have given away, our governments have given away that money, mostly to the high income earners because they're the ones who get the biggest tax cuts. They are. That's, that's true. And when you look so it's at all Canada, just a story. When you look at Canada towards other countries as well, we have uh, the tax effort, if you wish, the percentage of revenues that come to the public sector uh, in Canada has dropped. In 1997, it was 36.7% of GDP went to, the, went to the government. We have now dropped down to 33.3%. A 3%, almost 3.5% drop in our share of revenues as a share of the GDP. And you compare that to other countries, Canada has now moved below the European 15, 15 members of the OECD in, in Europe, uh, where they average about 36%. And that's one of the reasons that they have a much more equitable society than we are creating in Canada at this point in time. And it comes right down to things like health protection and protection of food because. Uh, Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency are being starved of money. They're no longer able to do their jobs. In fact, in many cases, they've gone to work for the very industries they're supposed to be regulating because the government tells us there's simply no money for Health Canada. There's no money for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Yes. Obviously, they've just given that money away back to the very people who own the companies that yeah. these people are supposed to be regulating, and we're all paying a price. Yeah, the regulator has become... The governor. Yes. The, uh, We're not the regulator, the, the regulated, the industry has become the governor and determining what we do. You know, we keep hearing that we can't afford to pay uh, um, the people who clean our hospitals mm -hmm. and who make mm -hmm. food in the hospitals. They've had yeah. to go from, you know, a living wage of around 19 mm -hmm. or $20 an hour down to a poverty wage mm -hmm. because there's no money. Yeah. But when we look at those figures, um, what we see really is that our governments, without asking us, we're, we're not involved in this at all. We're just told that low taxes are always better. Mm -hmm. So the government reduces taxes on those who have the most. And then more and more people are thrown into a poverty situation. Absolutely. In the, in the, uh, in the, in, in a, just in BC, in our healthcare sector, as an example, the, all those cuts that were made to the healthcare workers and the dropping of their income is from $15 an hour to $8 an hour, uh, essentially happened to pay more and more money to physicians. And in, in BC, physicians 
make up 10% of the healthcare workforce and their in, their share of income for all the money paid to healthcare workers uh, has gone from about 32 or 33% of the total amount of money spent on uh, healthcare services. The physicians now are up to 37 or 38% of the income of all the other people in the healthcare sector. So those those expenses or those those cuts of liberal government, I believe, purposely went after the lower paid workers to help pay the massive increase that they gave physicians when physicians were already making almost 40% more than the Canadian average or being paid 40% more than the Canadian average in, in, uh, when they came into office. And of course, a lot of those cuts also went to pay the profits of the new private companies that took over oh, yeah. cleaning. Well, and well, you look at MSP. Well, MSP, when it was a government operation, it cost us $23, $24 million a year to run MSP. That's medical services medical plan. services plan. Uh, first year out uh, with uh, the private firm that has been sub that has been contracted out to now, the cost went up to forty million dollars. And these are the things that are never mentioned in the media. They just tell us that private is better. So yeah. costs have gone from twenty four million dollars a year up to forty million dollars a year just overnight. Now I don't know what the, uh, have to look up and find out what, what it is this year, but I'm su suspect it's substantially more than forty million dollars this year. If it was still in the public sector, if it was still being run by the government, my guess is it probably would cost probably in the vicinity of uh, 28 to $30 million a year to do it. Let's finish off by talking about um, the real estate situation. Uh -oh. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know, a lot of the blame for the current economic situation around the world has been put on the subprime mortgage fiasco mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States, which it was no surprise. I heard about it more than three years ago from a friend who, who follows these things. So for anyone in the industry to say they were surprised by the subprime mortgage thing or they thought these things really had value when they were selling them to innocent investors, mm -hmm. that's simply not true because the people at the top certainly knew that the subprime mortgage was just a disaster waiting to happen. But where are we now with real estate that's in both Canada and the United States, and where are we going to be going? Well, there's a fellow named Robert Schiller, who I would uh, advise the listeners to, uh, to, to look up and read. You can find him on the, uh, on the Internet. He's a, he's a professor at Yale. How do you he, spell his name? S-H-I-L-L-E-R, Robert Schiller. And he uh, has, uh, his work has been translated now into what's called the Case Schiller Index on Housing. It's reported every month. It's probably the best, the most accurate housing indi indicator of what's happening in the U.S. real estate industry, uh, home real estate industry. And uh, the last month showed no reduction in the rate of decline. And it was down, I believe, 18% year over year, the month of December over the month of December the year, year previous. So 18% decline in... In prices. In the United States. In the United States. States. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. No, it's making houses more affordable for a whole lot of people in one sense. But for all those people that got into mortgages that they can't afford, and there are so many people encouraged to buy a house, you mean, had to have this house, they were begging people to take loans to buy houses. Yeah. And uh, that's all collapsed. So if you look over the last couple of year period, in some parts of, that, that's across the whole U.S., there are some places where it's down 50 and 60 percent. In particular, Places in Florida, California, Arizona, um, even states like Georgia. I, I have a friend who's, uh, whose son is in Georgia, and he's just bought four houses for $200,000. In a matter of a couple of years ago, he couldn't have bought one of those houses for that amount of money. That's how much it's tanked. In BC, uh, numbers just released last month were down 14% for in, in Victoria. A big fear I have is around the... Um, the condo industry, I think, is grossly overdeveloped. A lot of these units have been bought on speculation. They're still not finished. There's some units, they just stopped building them in Vancouver, I understand. So expect more to slide. And just on the way over here this morning, it was noted that normally there's around 25 to 30,000 square feet of commercial space come on the market every month. And in the month of January, we had over 100,000. And so far in the month of February, we've had a quarter of a million square feet of commercial space coming on. So if the, spirit, the real estate slide has now moved from the residential sector to the commercial sector in a big, big way. You've been watching Face to Face. Thanks very much for joining us today. We've been talking to Don Scott about the, um, the economic situation, taxation, who runs the country, 
uh, what has caused this mess and where we can expect it to go and a little bit about solutions as well. Thanks very much for watching.